But we have a saying, when you come and you ask and you knock on heaven's door, you knock like a Mongolian. This is the way Mongolians knock on the doors and they're, and they're around gears that some of them live out in the countryside. They knock and they never stop knocking until you come. Well, it is a joy to be here, and um, when I come to, to church and meet with believers, I expect to meet with believers, but also meet with God. How about you? I'm not thinking about what I'm doing next. Like, just like I said before, we're in the now. I've already been touched by God's presence. Appreciate Robert's word this morning in prayer. Brad's, yeah, and this afternoon also. It spilled on over this afternoon. <laughs> And the worship was great, and it will tie into the message today, too, that I got, I believe, from the Lord. So one more time, let's agree. You guys ready to hear something from the Lord, but also to be touched by the Lord? Amen. All right, the, the title of the message today as we go into prayer is called The Three Greatest Things. As we look into our new year, setting priorities, as Susie was sharing, uh, for life, um, being a believer now for, I think it's 40 years and almost married that long, um, I have really boiled the cabbage down to the three things I'm going to share as being to me the most important things right now in our Christian walk. So I hope you, um, you agree, I hope you receive uh, the truth, but also that we each receive fresh grace to do those things, because we can't do it in ourselves. Anybody found that out? Yes, sir. You have? Thank you, Susie. Amen. Well, Father, we love you. We thank you. We're here to meet with each other. That's what the church is. But also we're to meet with you. You're the head. And Holy Spirit, you give life and vigor and vitality and even vinegar uh, to the body. So Holy Spirit, would you continue your presence moving among us? Thank you for your word this morning, your worship. Thank you for the spirit of prayer and intercession being released into this house. Now, Father, God, just touch us each deeply, myself included today, with truth and give us grace to do the truth we're going to hear about this morning, this afternoon, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm catching myself. So, uh, sister, thank you for, where are you? Who did the? She's in the nursery. Yeah, she, she does PowerPoints, and she is a PowerPoint in the nursery, so she, she did the PowerPoint for me. But anyway, the th uh, three greatest things, you're probably wondering what they are. Well, you're going to hear about it soon. But before we list these three things from the Word of God and receive grace to do those things, uh, we got to start first, as we've already begun, going to the greatest one of all. Amen. You can't do the great things unless we know the great one. So I just have it in my heart to read you my favorite psalm, which to my heart, and I don't think I'm any different than you, really magnifies Jesus, magnifies God himself. Jesus is God, of course. And, um, and it, there's something about reading the words in this particular psalm that stir up my heart. It's kind of like a bubbling brook. It's like um, Pellegrino in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> or if you're, you like France, which I, I pray for France, there's other bubbled water comes from there too. But I'm in Psalm 145. So you can look at it or you can just listen um, and allow the Holy Spirit just to magnify Jesus one more time this morning, this afternoon. All right. The, the visiting pastors get grace? No. You should know by now. All right. Psalm 145. Uh, the psalmist says, I will extol thee, O God, O King. I will bless thy name forever and ever. When, when something hits your heart, you can say amen, okay? I will extol thee, O my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Amen. Every day I will bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty. Amen. 
and of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of the might of thy awesome acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter, that's bubbling right there, they shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Anybody glad today? The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. That's what we do when we get together. To make known to the sons of men, like we just sang, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Isn't this good? Amen. I'm just taking a deep breath because as your, as your heart is alive in the Lord, these are, these are, this is fuel. This is high octane JP6 jet fuel. Um, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Thy dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all that fall and raises up all those that are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thy hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, holy in all his works. The Lord is high and he's near unto all them that call upon him and to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that reverence and fear him. He also will heal, or excuse me, hear their cry he will heal also and will save them. The Lord preserves all them that love him, but all the wicked shall he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Right there, if you read that to me in my life, and again, I don't think I'm any different than you. There's, there's chapters, there's Psalms like that. Whenever I read them, they just elevate my spirit, my soul, quicken my body, and uh, I get my mind over the small things, even over the challenges that are going on in my life, and all of a sudden, God just is big, and he dwarfs these things. He's so great, he's mighty, he's full of majesty. So before we get into the truth of, of God's word, the teaching we're gonna do today, I just wanted to, to lay out how big and awesome and great God is because everything great flows from him. Amen. Amen. Three greatest things. The first one, I think, is an easy one that you will get. But how many know we need to be replenished, we need to be restored, we need to be revived in these truths? The greatest, first greatest thing is the greatest is love. L-O-V-E, the agape type of love. And this challenge and this promise of God comes forth really great in a number of scriptures. And um, first one coming up, I think we have um, Matthew 22, 37 to 40 there. And Jesus said to his disciples, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Other scriptures, other Psalms, uh, excuse me, other um, De um, Deuteronomy and also other gospels say also with all our strength. So we are, this is the complete law of the prophets. Everything is encapsulated in those scriptures to love God fully. Like God gave all to us, we are to give all to him because he's worthy. Anything less than that is unworthy of God and actually unworthy of us. So we're to love God maximum. We're to love people that God places around us. Even the Muslims last night that came into Chick-fil-A. Right, Brad and, and Sherry? And they actually had the, the Christmas music shut down. Is that crazy or what? Brad and I got stirred up because he was home. This is his home, Chick-fil-A. He went there and he spoke to management. What is the deal, right? But we still have to love those people because they're, in, how many know you're in a dark place if you walk into a place and shut down Christmas music? You know? They need some life, they need some love. And some of them are open, some are not, but you're not gonna find out until we, uh, we try, amen? But when we're talking about the greatest is love, this is a very um, 
uh, how should I say, a very concentrated scripture that says it all. We're to just be totally abandoned in love with Jesus because he first loved us. And then we're to do that vertical connection with God as we just did in Psalm 145. And then, and then we're to make it horizontal and make it real as God gives us opportunity to love people. While we're sitting here um, this morning, just five minutes ago, we, this afternoon, we got a text, <laughs> the curse of the morning. Amen. Uh, we got a text from somebody we've been reaching out to. I have, a, I have a couple doctors I visit just to keep me fit as a fiddle. And um, one uh, doctor, she's a female doctor. She was, uh, just takes care of my feet because I travel a lot. How many know we got to have beautiful feet? Any, any way the enemy tries to hit the feet, she's, she kind of helps me fight it with, uh, with Susie with me. But anyway, Lord quickened to me just uh, a week or so ago as we're visiting her to just ask her, is there anything we can pray with you for? And man, she just opened up and she just shut down every, everybody else she was going to see, stayed in the room with Susie and I, and began to just bear her heart and share what's happening in her life. Her husband's a physician, left him. She's trying to raise her children and her husband's still working. Just tears flowing like a Niagara, you know. So on her own, you know, we prayed with her, of course, and encouraged her and gave her some uh, godly counsel. But then she said, you know, would you guys be willing to meet with me for coffee? You know, so we just got the text. She wanted to set up a time just to meet so we can just love her. She's our neighbor. You know, she goes to church. I don't know where she's at in the Lord, but that's a good start. She has a, a fear of the Lord. So we're to love God. We're to love people. And um, this is the first and the great commandment, as we just read. Along with that, before we define love, to me, love also is identified in our commitment to the kingdom of God. Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to obey me. And a great scripture, of course, is Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. How many really can say amen from your heart that you found that to be true? If we truly are, I didn't hear anything there. I know I, was, I, I didn't give you much time to answer. But I have found if I seek first, not my will, not my kingdom, but the purposes of, the, of God's heart, of the advancement of his kingdom, he truly has added everything that I need in my life. That means I'm not first. Susie doesn't mind me saying that. Susie's not first. My children are not first. Jesus is first. He's my first love. And, and the kingdom of God is the most important thing. As we um, directed mission organizations and have been missionaries and gone to countries, uh, guess who came with us, whether they liked it or not? Susie. No, she liked it. <laughs> it's my children. They, they came and they found out that they liked it. And we lived in countries at different times. And in reflection, I got great kids. They're all serving God. Uh, four, or five, four out of the five are worship leaders. Um, it all began because as fathers, uh, no, we only have one father on the earth, father and mother, we lived our life in such a way that we sought first the kingdom of God. We we're at church when we needed to be. Our last daughter, Harvest, was born. Uh, and three hours later, Susie was on the keyboard uh, at the worship team. That yeah, that was stupid. I should have let her rest, but we were just zealous for God, and I think it was a worship conference going on, and it was important that Susie be there. And strike that. But everything else I said is true. Reaching the lost, making disciples, building, strengthening, pastoring the church, being where we needed to be. Our children, we didn't just teach them that. We torched them with that, because that's who we are. And did we do it religiously? Did we do it um, mean? And we got to be, no, we, this is our life. The church is our life. We always live real close to the church. We still do. And we're there a lot. And um, it's, there's just grace and there's a joy when you love Jesus, you love his people, you love the body, you love the things that he loves and everything else, houses, cars that run good, hamburgers, steaks, right? Everything flows out of that. I have really found that to be true. How about you guys? It's really true. It's when that, that little thing, that love for God, love for his purpose, get off a little bit, all of a sudden we start having problems. Amen? Let's define love. 
I love to remind myself, and uh, we're going to put definitions up there. Um, I'm taking these out of the Amplified Bible, and I'm just doing uh, verses 4 to 8. But would you allow the Word of God to penetrate you, to forge you one more time? This is God's definition of love, not man's. Number one, love endures long and is patient and kind. See these faces? These are happy faces, right? We may have, uh, how about this? We have conviction in this church. We stand against abortion, but we're not mean about it. We don't like it when someone goes into a Christian restaurant and shuts the, off the Christian, uh, Christian music. You know, we have convictions about that, but we're not mean about it. We can, we can smile and say, stop that. Or if you really want, anybody really want to get a Muslim upset? It's just going out over the airwaves. <laughs> Wish them Merry Christmas. They don't like that at all, but they need to hear that. Joyous Christmas. Okay, so love endures, love's patient, love is kind. How do you measure up? Don't raise your hand and don't shout me out. Love never is envious, nor boils over with jealousy. Love is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. I heard someone, I uh, heard a teaching recently, and the title of it is, uh, of is this. And this is coming against boasting or vainglory, being proud. Where we are clean, we walk unseen. Where we are clean, where we're right with God in any area of our life, where we're clean and holy, submitted to the Lord, we walk unseen. In other words, we're not ambitious for ourselves. We don't have to be up front. We don't have to say to everybody, like sometimes our flesh wants to say, hey, look at me. What about me? When you are clean, when you are you're inside of you, your heart, my heart is right with God. Where you are clean, you're perfectly content because you're right with God to walk unseen. That really spoke to my, my heart the first time I read that. I just wanted to share that with you. Love is not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. Love is not rude, unmannerly, does not act unbecomingly. Love does not insist on its own rights or its own way or is not self-seeking. Love is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done unto it. Love pays no attention to uh, suffered wrong. Love does not rejoice at injustice or unrighteousness, but love rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. Even flooded basements around Christmas time, we had one. Our sump pump, which I had just maintained. I was a diligent homeowner. Stop working in the middle of some rain. Next thing I know, it's a finished um, bedroom down there. I have a daughter, Tabitha, who lives down there. She's our secretary in the missions department. She got out of her bed, boom, like inches of water. How many have been through things like that? Wet carpet. Well, that, that, huh? Wet everything. Yeah, wet everything, like all their prized possessions. Shoes. Young women love shoes or something about shoes. Purses. Huh? Purses. Purses, things like that. <laughs> Devastating. And, um, and anyway, she handled it good. She's, she's a missionary girl also. She loves Jesus. But we just, um, everything finished up with um, getting the, all, all the water sucked out. Um, new carpet, new molding, new everything downstairs. Are you with me? We had good insurance, but it still took three weeks. You know when it was done? Christmas Eve at 5 p.m. Just enough time for Susie, because the water was off and everything else, just enough time for Susie to cook the greatest gumbo you ever tasted. We used to live in New Orleans, so she knows how to make some good gumbo. Amen. So um, the, point, the point I'm making is uh, love bears up under anything and everything that comes. How many know bad sump pumps come? May, may they never come to you, and may we never, we got a brand new one in there, and I'm getting the best backup sump pump money can buy. Are you with me? Amen. It's worth the expense. Okay, love is ever ready. And this is important. Love is ever ready, ever ready, to believe the best about every person. You ever 
find some, maybe somebody, um, somebody great, something, you hear something negative about that thing, you then have a chance, an opportunity to love and not listen to that rumor or listen to that uh, negative things spoken about, because that might end up being you someday, but you get to just love and believe the best about people. How many of that will go a long way in life? Just believe the best before, you know, if the worst is true, well, let it, let it happen, two or three witnesses, but start off believing the best about everybody. Don't listen to rumors, don't listen to the negative talk, amen? Love is faithless under all circumstances, it endures everything, Love never fails. How many think it'd be really great as we move into 2016 to move in by the grace of God as lovers of God, as lovers of people? And I want to encourage you to keep that definition before you get it. If you don't have an amplified Bible or your software in your computer, you know, as you you um, become what you think about, you be you meditate on that. And pretty soon you'll start, you'll be checked when you're out of love and you'll be encouraged in the Holy Spirit when you are. Hey, right where we are, can we ask the Holy Spirit to come and just baptize us afresh in the love of God? We can't do this unless we have the Holy Spirit who is a spirit of love in us. You guys ready? Ready to open up your hearts? Got to do this because of the interest of time here. But Lord, I, I'm with my brethren here. Lord, we want to do the greatest thing after honoring and worshiping you as the greatest one. Lord, we want to be lovers. We want to represent you rightly. But Lord, we know we, um, we got a new nature in us as we're born again, but we still got some flesh. We still got some pockets of unselfishness. But Lord, this afternoon, would you just saturate us afresh with the love of God. Let the love of God, Father, be released uh, through us. Let the love of God be foremost. Let it be a banner over our lives. Let it be the banner over this house, this legacy house. And Father, may we walk in love. That doesn't mean we're compromisers. That doesn't mean we're, we're, um, we're weak. It means we're strong. And uh, so Lord God, would you just help us, help this church, help us in whatever we, we do to let these words penetrate our hearts and let us be lovers of God and lovers of men and women in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, that's a good word, isn't it? Amen. Okay, number two. We talked about the greatness of love. Number two is the great completion. We also happen to sing a song today about missions and reaching the lost. And um, this is, the things I'm sharing with you are so deep in me. These are things, by the grace of God, I'm not perfect in them, of course. But these are things that the Lord has shown me over the years and decades to make them a priority. So love is a priority. The more I'm loving, the more whole I am, more holy I am as I'm loving people. Love, love is the game changer. Love changes things. It's, it's the antichrist weapon of choice, amen? The second is to find your place in the great reason why there is a church here at Legacy, the great reason why we've been born for such a time as this, and that is to see the great commission to go into all the world to preach the gospel become the great completion. I believe our generation, and I'm around young people all the time around the world, we're raising up Bible schools called Roar Schools. A lot of you know about those. But these young people coming up, as I ask, even when we start a new Roar School, just got back from Russia, I asked um, 16 students there in Siberia, how many of you feel that God is calling you to the nations to reach the lost, to reach the unreached, to reach those who have never heard about Jesus or the gospel before? Guess how many of those 16 raised their hands aggressively? 16, no, probably 17. There was a couple other visiting while I was there sharing. But yes, everybody, and I can say that's true for our school in India, it's certainly true for our school uh, in Crown Point, uh, in Mongolia, all of them, even before we preach missions, already have a call. They don't even understand what that is other than they need to go to the nations. So, um, 
Do some of you need to come to the Roar School? If you're between 18 and 30, yes, you need to consider that. I'll, I'll just do a little recruiting. But some, all of you need to do a few things. All of you, I hope you do this in your prayer time, you need to pray for the nations. And as we continue to cross-pollinate, we want to give you the names, real names of real people and pictures of missionaries that have come out of our church and other churches in the NRP network. And one day there's going to be missionaries coming out of this church. So, and that means also not just career missionaries going. We got five new ones on the field this year in Thailand and Siberia. Uh, they happen to all be women of God. It's amazing. My best disciples are, are young women who are just sold out completely to Jesus. The men are coming. But maybe as you hear about a short-term mission trip to, say, Mongolia next summer, some of you might be quickened to come with us. June 21 through July 2nd. Yeah, June 21 through July 2nd. <laughs> what else are you doing? What would be cooler than going into Mongolia and, uh, and most, the most loving people, huh? Yeah, it's a combo trip of construction, of children's workers, and just encouraging uh, the church. Tuesday and I will be there in, in April, right? And praying, participating by actually going, and also provision in giving to missions. I believe every one of us need to find our place in the Great Commission, in the Great Completion. If you, if you don't do that, you're missing out on something very great. Right from this place, you can touch the nations of the world. Susie and I have had the privilege to be in about 50 nations and lived in quite a few. Now at this stage in our lives, now we train up the next generation, envision them, get provision for them, launch them. I pastor them over the field. Uh, one of them um, used to be our executive secretary. Her name's Cora Lee. She just wrote early this morning. I heard the blink go on my phone. And um, she's doing great. She's in Siberia. and, and uh, People are getting saved in the churches she's working with. And she is a, just a great exhorter and lover of people. Loves the word of God. She's just great. Well, she, all of a sudden her voice went out. She can't talk. Isn't that the weirdest thing? The strength of her life is, is teaching and preaching and encouraging. And her voice went out. So wouldn't it be cool if we can connect? And um, even when, when we're traveling, besides just Facebook officially, would you pray for Pastor Dick and Susie as they head out to Cambodia in February, right? Being involved in the Great Commission, the Great Completion, is one of the greatest things that God has called us to do. That's all I can tell you. This gospel, and why is it great other than reaching the lost? Look at Matthew 24, 14 with me. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, can someone say all the world? Beautiful. For a witness unto all nations, can someone say all nations? And that word nations means ethnic groups. Our, our specialty is taking the gospel where no one has gone before in the, in the ethnic groups of the world. And here's the, here's the trigger. And then shall the end come. We will go on permanent vacation. In heaven, of course, we'll have stuff to do because we're made to do stuff. We're going on permanent vacation when Jesus comes to get us and bring us to heaven. But first, we've got to fulfill our vocation. And that is to be part of the active, the militant church to bring the gospel, not only to our neighbors, but to the dark places of earth. Someone's got to do it. Why not us? Right? Amen. Amen. So the greatest is love. I believe the greatest also is the great completion. This, we give ourselves to Jesus and our family. We give ourselves to the nations. And we've had the greatest life a person can have in the world. Is that right? For us, our life is not boring. It's, it's, it's exciting. So some of you already have exciting life. Some of you need a little bit more excitement. So come on with us to the nations of the world. You, you come with us and you can ride elephants in Thailand. You can ride camels in Mongolia. You can ride piranhas in the Amazon. No, <laughs> strike that also. My first time going into the Amazon area of Brazil, the first thing we did, we went to the marketplace and found big piranhas that were for sale, they were dead, and we ate them. We made a statement. No piranhas are gonna eat us. We're gonna eat you, amen. 
And the third thing, in the interest of time, the third thing, as we uh, talked about it, we sung about it tonight, about heaven coming, is the great awakening. God has the greatest outpouring of heaven the world has ever seen poised to be released upon our generation. And uh, here's a quote by Jonathan Edwards. I think it's in there. Yeah, this is one of my favorite revival quotes from one of my favorite theologians besides uh, Pastor Baird. God, God has had it. I just love being around Brother Kevin because I always feel smarter. My vocabulary always increases around him. Has anybody noticed that about him? You know, there's just something about him. Pastor Ron is not far off. These guys are sharpened axes. So I've got to keep a sharpened heart just to keep up with these guys. I cannot compete, but if my heart is good, I, I can add something into our mix. But listen to Jonathan Edwards' great quote here. He was part of the, the first great awakening in the 1700s that really birthed our nation. God has had it much on his heart from all eternity, eternity to glorify his dear and only begotten son. And there are some special seasons that he appoints to that end, wherein he comes forth with omnipotent power to fulfill his promise and oath to him. Now these are times of remarkably, remarkable outpouring or pouring out of his spirit to advance his kingdom. Such a day is the day of his power. And I do a whole course on the roar on the revival, but there's been seasons, I don't live in the past, but I'm encouraged by what's happened in the past with real people just like you and me. A great revival that took place in 1949, uh, the Hebrides revival off the coast of Scotland, and the whole town, the whole island was, was saturated, I like to use that term, with the presence of God. All the miners got saved, happened in Wales, happened in Los Angeles, happened on the east coast of America. I've been to all these revival sites. And um, it happened, and I want to specifically highlight this, in Hebrides in 1949, it happened when two elderly ladies were praying. One was blind, right? And one couldn't even move, she had arthritis. Those two, and I don't see any folks with arthritis or blind here, but it doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, these two ladies had it in their heart to begin to pray that the Holy Spirit would come to their, their island. It was a mining, mining island, ungodly people weren't coming to church, youth were not serving God, and they just have it in their heart to start praying. Well, God came and saturated that island. And it's such a notable revival, you can read about it. So many great things happened. <clears throat> the police had to wear white gloves. There was nobody to put in jail. The drunk stopped getting drunk. The mules in the mine shafts wouldn't respond any longer to the miners because they weren't cursing anymore. They didn't understand their languages. They did not understand the language of kindness, right? Crazy stuff like that happened, but thousands and tens of thousands were brought into the kingdom of God supernaturally. It happened because just two were consistent and persistent in prayer. We have a saying, I pray every Saturday night for the last four years with my Roar students and other times, of course, during the day. But we have a saying, when you come and you ask and you knock on heaven's door, you knock like a Mongolian. This is the way Mongolians knock on the doors and they're, and they're around gears that some of them live out in the countryside. They knock and they never stop knocking until you come. You might be in the sleeping, you might be in the bathroom. When they start knocking, they're never gonna stop until you open that door. How many think that's faith talking in the area of revival? God loves it when we keep knocking, when we keep persevering in prayer, when we never give up. We're knocking on heaven's door. Till what? Till heaven comes to earth. Till God rends the heavens, rips the heavens and he sends his presence and his glory that will mean the revival of the church and the harvest and the salvation of many. Amen? Amen. Finishing up with just a couple scriptures, here we go. Hosea 10, 12. It is time to seek the Lord till he comes. So I wanna encourage you to, just as you are gonna do some fasting next month, and some of you are already doing this, probably in your life groups, but find corporately who are some folks that you can agree with and not let God 
go, you know. I do this with my students. What time is it? Or I do it with the whole church at Living Stones. What time is it? And no one looks at their watches. They say, it's time to seek the Lord. How long are we going to seek him? Till he comes. comes. That's revival. See, before God comes for the church and brings us up to heaven, he's going to first come to the church and manifest presence and manifest glory. One more, Jeremiah 33, three. There's, a, there's a thousand of these, but call unto me, says the Lord, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you've never seen before. For these things God must be inquired of, and he must be inquired of in faith, and he's about ready to come. Last thing I'm saying is on Christmas night, I live right next to our church, Living Stones, We have 20 acres of land. Hope you guys come visit. Some of you have been there. And we have a big parking lot, of course, for the church and for the Roar School. And um, I just had it on my heart Christmas night to go there and be there and just walk around at night. And I was rehearsing before the Lord, not that God has a short memory, but rehearsing to him how many days, how many nights, how many hours, how many months, how many years we've been calling upon him reminding him of his promises, praying from late at night, sometimes into early morning with students and with intercessors. And um, I am in my heart totally confident. You know, first is seed, then is time, then comes harvest. The time is up to the Lord, right? But if we're seeding in our hearts and reminding God in a sense, speaking his promises back to him. Those are seeds, and God, his timing is perfect. And I am so confident that I, I've been in outpourings before, and I've been in his presence and been turned inside out at different times. But I believe he has the father load of blessings, if only the church. Now I wanna challenge you to a race. Is revival gonna come first to Crown Point, or is it gonna come here? to this area of Charleston and your church, you know? It's gonna be up to us yielding. I do the same thing with Mongolia and Russia and India. It's a race for revival. All of us, all the students are praying. And why are they praying? Not just for an experience, we love the presence of God, but that we might see the greatest harvest heaven and earth have ever seen before of every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. Would you guys stand up with me as we finish? If you will. The boy.